Good morning, my friends. This is Paul, and welcome to another episode of ISTJ Info Dumping. This time, this was actually a request from one of my viewers, and I was asked, what is the process of being an ISTJ author? Especially as most of us aren't particularly known for our creativity and love of embracing new and exciting ideas. Unfortunately, I feel like that's a gross misexaggeration and a fundamental lack of understanding of how the function stack works. Just because extroverted intuition is all the way at the bottom doesn't mean it doesn't exist. On the contrary, it's usually the function that we fear to use or overall get the most antsy when we're forced into situations where it needs to be done. But if we really push ourselves and have our own space and our own time, then it can be surprisingly effective, especially if we're in our comfort zone. Now, before I get further into this, I just want to make a quick disclaimer that this was a video that I put off for quite a while deliberately, most because I, re I didn't really want to do it. Like, I finally got The Witcher 3 in the mail. But that game is taking so long just to beat, and I'm not even trying to do a vast majority of the side quests. Then Animal Crossing New Horizons just came out. That's taking its share of time. Those are the videos I want to do. But I've kind of been known as like the ISTJ Myers-Briggs expert. So there's like half of me that says, ooh, this is a golden opportunity to tell the world about our type, which I, in my personal opinion, I think we're even more misunderstood than the INFJs. But then the other part of me is like, but Paul, your channel started out not even talking about Myers-Briggs. Well, I'm just going to shove aside my feelings and realize the world needs to be set straight with the stereotypes and what's actually true. So if I seem a little bit down in this review, it's because I was kind of dreading getting in front of the webcam for this. So first of all, when I say that I'm an author, that's a little bit different than saying that I'm a writer. A writer is someone who likes to express ideas in a written format, be it in a journal, be it in a word pad, whatever type of writing device you use, assuming they don't come up with yet another form in the future. An author is someone who's actually gotten their works published, either via fan fiction or by paperback copy, although I think a lot of people don't consider fan fiction to be a true author, and that's like its own category, a fan fiction author. Thankfully, I happen to fall into all three categories. There are lots of things that I have written that I haven't published out of fear of the media and the public taking what I intended and misconstruing it into making it something that I never intended. So as a result, I have all these cool, creative ideas, but I choose not to share them with anyone but my trusted friends because what if they think that I'm advocating something that is actually 100% against my personal views? So in other words, the introverted intuition is taking over the extroverted intuition by saying, mm -mm, the Bible says not to do that. I do want this fiction to be cool, but I don't want people to start another Protestant Reformation just because, oh dear, Paul preaches this and he's a Catholic? Heaven forbid, almost literally. So I just decided, you know what, in the world of all this misinterpretation and people believing in moral relativism, I thought it was better just to find select people that I knew would ask me questions and say, how much of this is fiction versus how much of this is your actual point, and then show it to those people. Also, if they showed enough commitment to actually finish the books. But I have gotten a book published. I'm not going to repeat the title of it because I think I might have said too much in my last interview about writing. But I did get a book published. It's in paperback. I've even autographed a few copies for people. It sold terribly to my knowledge and I hardly make any money off of it. But what was important to me was getting out the message as opposed to trying to have extravagant living. I would say that my current living arrangement is probably upper middle class of United States standards, and I'm pretty okay with staying like that. I'm not like this super unknown type of guy. Like in the Catholic world, I'm kind of a celebrity, but in the grand scheme of things, I'm one of the smaller people 
when you've got YouTube giants like MatPad and Gerard, and I kind of want to keep it that way. Being an author means you have to be like consistently exposed, and the pressure of that can sort of make you want to give up on that pursuit of being an author because people will constantly pressure you to do more, to make it better. You could spend sleepless nights and weeks trying to make a cool chapter and then people say that's terrible. And the overall amount of pressure and work and the fear that manuscript, uh, manuscript critiquers will just say this stinks and then not want to publish it. So what's the point of taking all that risk when you might end up just being a failure when you can just send your manuscript to your friends? It's a lot to think about and it's not something we ISTJs like because we're not generally known for liking to take risks. We like to invest in stuff that we know has a definitive or at least fairly definitive chance of actually working. Of course, unpredictable stuff happens. But generally speaking, we don't like unpredictable stuff, so we try to prepare for a worst case scenario wherever we go. Now, what about fan fiction? That's the third category of author. Well, you'll be pleased to know that I've done that too, except I also I haven't exactly done fan fiction per se. Yes, my work was published on a fan fiction site. If you want to check it out for yourself, I'll leave a link in the description regardless. But just in case you have a super good memory like me, just look up Archive of Our Own, and then type in Zero Time Dilemma Sigma's Story. My pen name is Joseph Davidson. Anyone who knows me <laughs> will appreciate the reference, but for those of you that don't, I prefer you to just stick with that as far as knowing any hints about my past that I haven't made publicly available. And it's basically me attempting to take one of my favorite video games ever, Zero Time Dilemma, and make it like a director's cut of sorts, because I thought the Zero Escape series was incredible. I initially started by making a, a walkthrough of Zero Time Dilemma. I did solutions to everything. I did the ideal route for how you're supposed to play the game, because it's very non-linear. And then I also did a Catholic analysis of every major chapter, saying like, what Catholic themes can we spot here? Maybe what can't we spot? And overall I wanted to make it so intense, but I also didn't know where to publish it. So I ended up basically just reading it to select friends. That wasn't enough. My ex-girlfriend thought, well Paul, you wrote a walkthrough for the third game in a series, why don't you write for the first and second? To which I just eventually relented saying, fine, I'll do a summary of the story, I just don't want to do the whole solving puzzles deal because that was a pain to do in the original game. I think I almost got sick from that cube puzzle alone in the locker room or the infirmary of Zero Time Dilemma. So I did that and I still wasn't satisfied. So finally I decided, well, why don't I do Zero Time Dilemma again, but make it a novelization, which is not a new concept, but it's definitely fairly unheard of in the realm of Zero Time Dilemma and video games. So I took a game that's known for being non-linear and put it into a slightly more linear structure. Also changing up the protagonist so that it's from Sigma's point of view. I'm not going to say much more than that in case you haven't played the other two games and you want to go in completely blind. But suffice to say that I try to be as faithful to the original work of the game as possible while also enhancing it to fit a book format and adding in little tidbits that I think would probably be accepted as canon, but at the, at the current moment they're either loose canon or something that the developer said in an interview that he wasn't able to bring to fruition because budgeting, hard development, the game hardly even entered development at all. Like they actually canceled the series after the second game, but a petition known as Project Bluebird convinced Axis and Spike Chinsoff to make a third game anyway. And while it did certainly have its rough around the edges moments, I feel like it was a fantastic game that ended up disappointing a lot of new time or uh, long time fans because the director couldn't make all of his promises come true. So I gathered an interview, I gathered these promises, I gathered my own personal thoughts and wishes for how I wanted the series to conclude, but didn't try to go overboard. I thought, okay, let's not try to make this something that the director would be abhorrent about. So as a result, that led to certain things like keeping in scenes that my personal values don't mesh with very well. 
but realizing that's what what he wanted in the story. So it's rated M for like everything. So gratuitous violence scenes, sex, it's all there. Not necessarily displayed in overt detail, but it's still there because it means something in the grand scheme of the plot. Because even throwaway little lines that you don't think mean anything actually are foreshadowings of things to come. The one thing that I did want to do is I wanted to remove all profanity from the work because I felt like, yeah, when you're in a panic saw-like situation, you would want to swear a lot, but there are some characters that either don't swear at all or only have one word of profanity the whole game. And I thought, well, why don't I just make every character like that, but just exaggerate their anger to replace the profanity? So I feel like that was a pretty reasonable compromise, and I don't feel like there are too many moments in the story where the lack of profanity made their panic any less realistic. Do I think my works are perfect? Far from it. We ISTJs are our own worst critics. Now, it sounded a lot like I've mostly just been self-promoting my own work, but first off, it's free, so you can download it no cost because, you know, it's based on someone else's game, so if anything, you should be paying the developer to play his game that my novelization is based off of instead of paying me when... I would say approximately 85% of the novelization is straight from the video game and only about maybe 10 or 12% was me spicing things up a little bit, making loose canon actual canon. Um, but now to talk about from more of a, an objective, like what are ISTJs generally like? Well, first off, we're our own worst critics, as I said. So we tend to be overly pessimistic about our work, believing that we could have done better, that what the public sees as bad, we see as awful, and so on and so forth. But on the other hand, when we do think that something is great, we can come across as though we're bragging, even though I think it's really just us stating facts. It's kind of like, if we think something tastes good, we say that tastes good. Or we might finish a paint job and say, that's a mighty fine job if I do say so myself. We're just stating what's on our mind. We're not trying to say this is the greatest thing ever. We're not trying to have a pride complex. We're just being honest. And I know a lot of types have a hard time considering that or taking that as acceptable in the author world. But I think if you hate all your work altogether, then you're never going to be an author because you want to have at least a little bit of confidence. Otherwise, the audience is not going to think that the book is worth it because if the author hates it, then everyone else is going to hate it. But then again, J.K. Rowling didn't really like Prisoner of Azkaban. So, but yet a lot of people say Prisoner of Azkaban is their favorite Harry Potter book. So I guess maybe it's because she's so popular that people can disagree with her opinions anyway. I mean, they seem to do that with her Twitter. So I'm, I'm going to just give up on what she's trying to say there. The biggest thing to know about ISTJ authors is that we actually have a wide plethora of ideas and concepts going through our head. For me personally, a lot of them actually come from dreams, but it's often hard to take fragmented portions of a dream and transform that into a full novel with good plot twists and character development. So what I try to do is I try to look to the end of the novel first and then figure out how to piece my way to that novel bit by bit. Now, some of you might be saying at the moment, Paul, that sounds like an anything to do, to look at the big picture of things. However, there's one major difference between me and my best friend Andy, who's an INTJ, and that's he has a method known as the snowflake method. He didn't invent it, but he liked the concept so much that he decided to employ it for his own novels. He tried to explain to me how to do it, and I ended up getting a migraine trying to figure out how to, I guess, go that much in depth about something when I'd rather just think it over, take a walk, and come up with it just based on things that I personally would like to see. If I think it's super cool that in Star Wars The Force Awakens, Kylo Ren chops down a whole tree with his lightsaber, I might think, is there something I can do in my own book that's cool like that without ripping off Star Wars? Then I'll plan that. 
I also put a lot of inside jokes into my novels, which is not something intuitives particularly enjoy to my knowledge. They like to go off of sheer innovation as opposed to the nostalgia bug. But I would say that that's not entirely inaccurate that I hate innovation. I don't like over relying on cliches in my novels and do like to say like this is a wholly unique and new idea that no one has ever thought of or at the very least I haven't read any books that have this concept and if I'm mirroring something it's sheer coincidence. Let me give you an example. When my best friend and I were playing Fire Emblem Three Houses. This might be minor spoilers for a few of the routes, except for Blue Lions. There's a race of people known as the Agarthen Agarthens. The problem is that almost a decade earlier, Agarthen was the name of a town in my novel. The difference is that I pronounced it differently. Mine was Agarthen, there was Agarthen. And second, Agarthan was the name of the town, and the people that lived in the town in my book were Agarthinians. Whereas in Three Houses, the Agarthans are the name of the people. It's not based on a place. In fact, I don't even know what the place is called. Actually, I do, off the top of my head, but I'm not going to spoil it in case that spoils parts of the story. Suffice to say that we got a couple of really good laughs because we were like, the world is going to remember the Agarthans from Three Houses, but they're not going to remember my Agarthinians from my book that I slaved over in a novel because I chose not to get it published. And I think that's one of the pains of having introverted sensing to begin with, is we keep everything up here. And we don't see the need to journal as much as the other types because it's, it's pretty much redundant. It's kind of like if you're wearing a shirt and you feel the need to put on another shirt just because you feel like you're not already wearing a shirt. It kind of feels redundant. So why write something down when it's already up here? Or like if you put the same thing twice on the calendar, like doctor's appointment and then doctor's appointment under it when they're both the same time. Why do you do that? One doctor's appointment should be more than enough. So... A lot of times that's why our creativity goes unrecognized. And to give you a couple of reasons for why that is, well, I think I've covered it pretty sufficiently earlier, but in case you were dozing off, let me repeat a couple of examples. One, we don't want our messages to be misconstrued. If something is deliberately against our values, we don't want people to think that we're preaching it when we're actually not. Like those people that say that J.K. Rowling is promoting witchcraft in her Harry Potter books when she has said over and over again that was not her intention. But yet people still chose not to believe her and interpret it as a glorification of witchcraft. In the same way, people might take my books and say you're advocating for um, people not to get into romantic heterosexual relationships and it's like, uh, no. This particular passage just makes for really good fiction. And I would rather have good fiction over overt Catholic messages that make the story a drag. That's why I have a hard time reading Lord of the Rings. Because I feel like Tolkien tried so hard to incorporate Catholic theology that it made parts of the books really boring to read. And I know that might get me a couple of dislikes, but... It's a free country. I'm allowed to express my opinions. I just hope that fantasy authors, especially other ISTJs, can try to create a creative masterpiece without crippling themselves with trying to shove their values down their throat. It's kind of like why a lot of people in the Catholic circle didn't like the Solo movie, because it felt like a glorified SJW ad saying, like, this is how the world has to be. And whether or not you agree with social justice workers, having those agendas doesn't necessarily make the movie good. Star Wars movies are known for their themes of overcoming weaknesses and epic lightsaber duels, in the case of me. So bogging down a story with politics often makes it less enjoyable to the average consumer, which is something that I want to avoid at all costs. So this video is approaching the 20 minute mark. I don't really want to say any more, so I'll just say leave it in the comments if there's something I missed, if you need more clarification than what I've already given you. And I hope you'll check out Zero Time Dilemma Sigma's story if you're not afraid of being spoiled 
of stuff in 999 of Virtue's Esther Ward. And if you also have a pretty pretty tough stomach because there's a lot of questionable stuff in there that may scare off younger viewers. Although I really hope they're not on this channel because this is supposed to be copper, copper free. So with that, thank you very much for watching. I apologize if this went on too long, but I also think that ISTJs need to speak up about themselves more. So if I can break the trend, yay. So until the next time, keep the faith, stay epic, God bless. And if you get to know an ISTJ, ask him what kind of things he or sh she is working on. You might be surprised at their results. Bye-bye.